are apiarists, right? Sure. Which is a fancy word for saying beekeeper. <laughs> and this is Connie from Honey High Farms. She used to be our beekeeper here on site. Uh, and last year, Julie, where are you? Julie, where is she? Oh, she's hiding back there. Julie is now <laughs> our beekeeper. She decided to start a new hobby. Hopefully she hasn't regretted that decision. No. <laughs> and we have a hive over here. Now you're going to learn all about what goes on in that hive, why it's important, uh, why we need them, and to not be afraid of them. Because a so, lot of people freak out. Yes, my name is Connie. I am a master beekeeper. Um, some of you have probably heard the history. I didn't intend to be a beekeeper. Not on my radar at all. Um, I come from history, uh, legal, pharmacy backgrounds, um, but I'm from Missouri originally. And um, my father got bees at some point, um, and he kind of, your family talks you into weird things, right? Um, so in 2011, my husband and I bought a farm in Missouri, a state we no longer lived in, and 200 hives to get started. Um, I think beekeeping is great. Don't start with that many. It's a lot. Um, Start one, two hives, right, Julie? That, that's a little more comfort level. Um, so beekeeping, ver Missouri versus down here in the valley, a little bit different uh, beekeeping. The inner workings of the hive are the same, um, but we're year-round beekeepers down here versus even, say, Flagstaff. It's different beekeeping to a certain degree. They have a true winter. It's too cold for bees to go out and, and forage and fly. So um, your goal as a beekeeper up there is to say, hey, we're going into colder temps. You're at optimal health. You've got all the food you need to survive. I'm gonna wrap you up nice and warm and tight, and I hope to see you next spring. Down here, you do not get that time off. Um, it is all day, every day. Um, this morning, a little colder. Uh, they were probably inside a little bit longer, but they're out foraging. If you get a chance to look at her bees, um, they're pulling in all kinds of, of, of pollens. It's beautiful over there, so. All right, so um, has anybody taken a beekeeping class before? No, mine? <laughs> Details. Okay, so um, in any honeybee colony, there are actually three different types of bees, right? We have our queen bee, we have workers, and drones, sometimes, right? So our queen bee obviously is female. She's the mama. Her job is to lay eggs all day, every day. Um, do you have a guess as to how many eggs she lays daily? Sometimes more, yeah. So um, to show you what she looks like... This is what a queen bee looks like. Everybody see that? I'm like, whoop. All right? Um, and I do have a queen in here. Oh, I should have told you. Yes, these are honeybees. Um, they can't get out of here. This is a, a customized observation hive, so you guys can look at them up close. They can't touch your skin, even though they're pretty calm. Um, but our queen bee, she's got this really long, pointy abdomen. Okay? She is the only female bee that has a full reproductive system. Okay, and depending on the size of your bee colony and resources, she might be laying 1,000, 1,500 eggs a day, up to maybe 2,000, 2,500. Uh, I have some queen breeders that even say, oh, no, it's much higher than that. I would question that. So peg it 1,000, 2,000, you're, you're pretty good, okay? And that is she's laying one egg in each little hexagon cell all day, every day, okay? So our queen bee... She lives about two to three years on average. Uh, that's pretty common. Um, she, a couple of fun facts about her. She never learns to feed herself. She is actually fully relying on our worker bees to feed and clean her, which they will. If she's doing a nice job, she smells nice, doing a good job laying her eggs, they're like, yeah, we'll take care of you. But if she gets old or um, she's been damaged or she doesn't smell very good, you know, for whatever reason, they say, ah, we're going to stop taking care of you. We're going to raise a new queen that will hatch out as an adult, come find and kill you. So nature's brutal. That's just the way it is. Okay. So a couple other things about our queen. Um, she is the only honeybee that can sting multiple times and not die. Okay. Her stinger is like a needle point. Okay. Uh, I don't know anybody that's been stung by a queen bee. It's usually a researcher, somebody, somebody heavily messing with them. It's usually an accident. Okay, usually queen bees are pretty calm. They're just doing their job all day, every day, right? We always uh, hear like the queen is the master, right? But we say, well, she's really more slave than master in the whole grand scheme of things. So um, she's the most important bee, but uh, I, I would not want to be a queen bee, to be fully honest with you. She's got a rough life, 
So, um, our queen, um, I was going to say, I have her in here. I have her marked on her. So, there are three parts, right? We have our head, our uh, thorax, our abdomen. Um, her neck area, basically, I had her marked with a red mark for last year. We take pink pins. Um, the worker bees have kind of cleaned it off. Um, but when you come up and look, uh, they, you guys saw the queen. She's still marked, right? Um, so she's in there. Uh, so try to find her if you have a second. All right. Um, so then our next bee, we've got our worker bee, right? Those are the girls. Um, Celebrating women. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, I keep switching out all my slides for all my different you classes, class. but... Tell you what happens, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a worker bee. She's holding propolis. I'll show you in a second what that is, but um, worker bees are much smaller than our queen bee, obviously. They are all girls, uh, but they don't have a full reproductive system because their job is not to lay eggs. They don't make babies. A uh, queen puts off pheromones, hormones, that say, even though you're a girl, you're not a queen. I keep you in check. You've got different jobs. So a worker bee, they're really the ones that control the hive, to be fully honest. They have different jobs depending on how old they are. As soon as they hatch out as an adult bee, they're what we call a nurse bee. So their their first job is going around being a nurse to all the baby bees in development, feeding everybody, keeping them warm. Um, it takes a little practice, um, but to the trained eye, a nurse bee, um, her color is really light. Her pigmentation isn't in yet. And Terry, if you do not mind, sir, this is a nurse bee. This is an adult bee. Okay. Uh, those are Italian honeybees. But um, it's kind of helpful for me to know what a nurse bee uh, looks like because if I need to send a queen to somebody else, say, Julie needs a queen, I can't just take a queen bee, um, bring her up here because she needs somebody to go along with her to take care of her. She, she can't feed herself. So I try to take those really young nurse bees because when they're young like that, they're in high royal jelly production. Has everybody heard of royal jelly? Um, Terry's holding the slide, but there's this white milky substance that's produced by a gland on their head when they're really young like that. Perfect. Uh, so uh, that's helpful for a beekeeper to know, but like I said, it just takes a little practice um, because in an average hive, even just one box holds about 35,000 bees. So kind of picking uh, them out can be tricky sometimes, right, Julie? So um, as our worker bee gets a little bit older, uh, that royal jelly production kind of dies away because now they have a different job coming up. Uh, they might be in charge of um, they, actually, they might get um, housekeeping duty. Uh, sometimes they get mortuary duty. So uh, that is where an, if a bee dies in the house, another worker bee will physically pick them up, fly them out of the house and dump them to keep the house clean. Um, it's kind of funny to watch, to be honest, because you have this worker bee carrying this dead bee and they really struggle in the wind under the weight of this other bee. And you're like, just let go, you're outside the house. And they always say, no, it's gotta be way, way far out which makes sense uh, because if they happen to have died of some kind of virus, bacteria, they're like, I, I need it way far away from the house so we don't impact the rest of the colony. Make sense? Okay. Um, so as that worker bee gets older, um, they might be in charge of um, resources that are being brought back to the colony, kind of get passed off. Uh, they store it away in the honeycomb. Uh, eventually they're gonna get a wax gland that comes to maturity. And the best way I can describe it, it looks like dandruff flakes. It's these tiny little white flakes that they basically pack together. They make the honeycomb with them, okay? Um, and sometimes they will actually seal off that honeycomb cell um, if they're storing away honey or in development for babies at a pupa phase. They'll do that, okay? As they get older, um, they might get guard duty, guarding the doorway because bees steal from each other. Um, yeah, they steal each other's honey if they can. It's called robbing. Um, yeah, I, I was like, that sounds made up, um, but that's a, a true thing. It's not all that common, but it's more so in situations when there's just like everything has died off. Like this past summer was really rough, all the plants, because um, it was so hot for so long. Um, in that case, if uh, you don't have a, a small doorway, they can't protect their house if a big colony finds them. So they might uh, get all their honey stolen from them. Yeah. So we keep small doorways just to make it a little easier to defend their honey stock. Okay. Um, as they get older, um, final job of our worker bee is going to be foraging. So they might be gathering water um, 
and, and in the summertime, uh, my colonies, I don't know the exact ratio, but my colonies will use easily a gallon of water a day per hive. Um, it's not just con consumption, but it's also cooling the hive. So they will take water droplets, distribute it throughout the, the colony and fan it with their wings, like evaporative cooling. Yeah, to <laughs> regulate house temperature, which is amazing. Um, so it might be water, they might be gathering pollen. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen them gardening out and about, but when they land on a plant, it's like poof, pollen dust all over their little bodies, right? Um, I'll hand it to you, thank you, Vanna. Um, they basically, they'll, they'll use their mouth, their mandible, they'll, they'll kind of wet it, they comb it around, pack it on their back legs to be able to fly. Does that make sense? So, um, they go flower to flower, some of the dust falls off, pollination occurs. Um, in Arizona, um, typically the pollen colors that you'll see coming back are usually white, well, like an off-white, yellow, orange. Uh, but they can pull any color that they can actually access. Uh, but Arizona honey, it's the different plants that make different honeys. So I brought some local ones just to kind of give you an idea of what they look like color-wise. This one's kind of light this year, but typically you don't have a big variance in color uh, in, down here in Arizona. But to show you different plants, this is some of the lightest honey that you'll see. Not from, this is from Hungary. Uh, this is black locust honey. You can see really, really light. Okay. Uh, this actually is an Arizona honey, but it's a couple years old. Uh, this is star thistle. So you can see big, big difference uh, in color. It's just different plants, right? So beekeepers, as far as honey goes, uh, we always have wildflower honey. And that's where we don't know what the bees are on. They're on anything and everything. Uh, bees fly on average two to five miles. They're kind of lazy. So they'll stay to two if there's a, a resource. Um, but to have a, a particular variety of honey, say like an orange blossom, you have to have predominantly just one plant to say this is orange blossom honey. Otherwise it's wildflower. Does that make sense? In an urban setting here, you are getting wildflower. Um, so. You can always have your honey tested, but old school, you kind of just know what's in the area. Okay. All right. So uh, worker bees, um, they might, so we talked about they might get water, they might get pollen, they might be gathering nectar. So they've got this really long tongue. It's like a straw. They'll put it down in that flower. They'll slurp up the nectar. Um, it goes in their honey stomach, uh, which is not their digestive stomach. Um, it's sort of like a holding tank, essentially and they're going flower to flower till it's full. Then they fly it back home, regurgitate it, pass it off to another bee. Um, it actually, uh, enzymes uh, from the bees start the process of chemically changing that watery nectar into liquid honey. Um, but it takes a ridiculous amount of bee, bees to gather resources just to fill one little honeycomb cell, um, but they have to dehydrate it after it's full. So they will do that either by slurping it up, they, they'll spread the, the nectar out to kind of get air, um, air drying essentially, and then spit it back in the cell again and again and again, or they might actually fan it with their wings. Either way, uh, just to remove the moisture content, okay? Once that cell is full, optimal moisture content, another bee will come seal it off with wax. So that's as a beekeeper, that's how I know honey is ready to go. Um, this is to show you something else, um, but this is capped honey up top. You see that? Yep, yep. Okay, and this is pollen and wax moss. So, okay, so capped honey, little pollen down there. You can touch it if you want, but it's pretty sticky, just saying. Um, I, I do have wet wipes if you need it. And this is nasty, gross. Um, this is liquid honey still, Ooh, yeah. um, wax yeah. moss. Yeah, we know that. Yeah. Wax moths were our problem two years ago. Yeah, it happens. Okay. All right, so. All right, um, so our last bee that we have to talk about is our drone. Um, those are the males. Um, sometimes we have no drones at all. Sometimes all honeybees are female. Um, usually winter time, but maybe even like this past summer, it was so hot. They're like, we're not gonna devote any resources to, to drones. So um, let me show you what they look like, actually. Like, oh, sorry, all my slides are everywhere. Okay. 
So, and, and you guys afterwards, you can come and ask me questions, look at everything. But this is a worker bee. This is a drone. Okay. They're, they're bigger. They're, they're bigger than workers. Sometimes they're just as big as our queen. Sometimes smaller. It just depends on genetics. Um, but the easiest way to identify, hey, this is a boy, is their eyeballs. Um, they have these great big fat eyes more on top of their heads versus females tend to have a little bit smaller, more on the sides of their heads. So that's drones. All right. Our drones, their whole purpose is to help a queen mate. A queen will never mate with her own drones, though. It's, uh, it's kind of complicated, but just high level um, reproduction. If you have a brand new queen, uh, we call her a virgin queen, right? She probably just killed the old queen. She has to go mate with drones. Um, it's done up in the air. She'll mate with about 13 to 15 drones, and that's all the sperm she needs for the rest of her two, three year life, okay? Um, a queen can say, hey, I'm going to lay an egg, and it's gonna be a male. Or I add a drop of sperm, it's going to be a female. It's kind of just opposite, because I was like, no, sperm equals male. They're like, not really in honeybees. It's kind of just opposite, okay? So, um, it, it, if, if you've studied genetics, it kind of makes sense. That's her um, genetic line. She's not going to mate with her own drones. Okay, just high level. You don't need to know that. There is no test, I swear. So, um, so drones, when resources are scarce, um, the colony's like, we don't need you. Get out. And they will physically kick them out of the hive. And you'll see them hanging by the doorway like, can I come back in? I'm like, no, no. So they will starve or freeze to death, um, which is kind of sad, but that's just nature. It's the way it is. So um, the other thing with our drones, um, it, once they mate with the queen, um, they are done. They die right afterwards. So um, I'm like, we'll keep it PG for, for our crowd. But if you have more questions on it later, uh, you can come and ask me. So um, that's our three types of bees. Then um, in our life cycle, um, I, I'm sure everybody's kind of studied life cycles of creatures. Um, honeybees are very similar to caterpillars in that they start as an egg and then they eat, 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 wrap themselves in that cocoon. Uh, metamorphosis come out as something different, right? So kind of a similar process. So bees start out as a tiny little egg. Um, and the best way I can describe it, it looks like a miniature grain of white rice, right? I'm looking to Julie. I'm like, do you have something else? Uh, yeah, that is the hardest part of beekeeping easily because they are so very tiny, okay? Um, this is a three-day window at egg phase, okay? Um, they're, they're eating um, predominantly royal jelly. There, there's a mix to stuff, but um, after that three-day window, they shift to a larva phase. Um, at this phase, uh, the diet changes for the workers and the drones. So it's the diet that determines, is this female bee going to be a queen bee or a worker bee? Does that make sense? So our queen doesn't really get to decide. She can decide male or female. She doesn't decide, is this female worker or queen? Which is kind of sad because you're like, oh, <laughs> you're raising your replacement. Oh, great. So it's just the way it is. All right. So at larva phase, um, they are still being fed. Um, it's kind of complicated. They don't have mouths like we do. Sorry. I know, I should have a PowerPoint, but it doesn't work outside very well. Um, but after this window, we shift to a pupa phase. And they say, hey, you've been fed all you're gonna get. Thank you. Um, they're going to come along and put a wax cap up top and seal off that honeycomb cell. It's very similar to that cocoon, right? They keep growing, developing. When they're ready, they will actually eat through the wax cap and emerge as an adult bee. They're ready to go. So from egg to adulthood for a queen is about 15, 16 days. For a worker bee, it's 21 days. For a drone, it's 24 days. Um, on occasion where it's nice and hot and sunny like here, um, sometimes we get an emergency queen where they rush the development. Um, it's usually when they, they had um, a queen die unexpectedly. Hopefully they don't ever do that to you, but basically they rush this queen development through She's not great quality, but they say, hey, I just, I need a couple eggs. Um, and then we're going to replace her shortly thereafter. It, it happens. So, yeah, don't want to be a queen. <laughs> so, uh, that's development. Um, did you guys know there are actually different honeybee races? Did you know that? Um, I, I've probably told a few of you. What I knew when I first started in beekeeping, I was like, I don't know, there are bugs that sting and make honey. That was it. I didn't realize there was different honeys. I was like, what? They're like, no, there's different races of honeybees too. I was like, what? I just thought there were honeybees. I had no idea. 
Um, but it kind of makes sense. It's where they have originated from around the globe, right? So the common one that we typically see are the Italian honeybees, which are kind of that gold black color. Uh, that's the more common one that you're going to find here. Um, but honeybees actually weren't native to this continent. Uh, they were brought over with the European settlers when they came. So technically they're an invasive species, but we heavily, heavily rely on them. So we would like to keep them if at all possible. Okay. So um, every beekeeper has a different opinion upon, upon uh, genetics and what race is better and, and this and that. Um, I happen to like the Italians, uh, but I also keep carnelians, uh, which does not roll off my tongue. Um, I've kept Russian bees, uh, a couple different ones. So uh, if you have questions, ask me about it later. Just know that uh, there are different races of honeybees and they look different um, to a certain degree. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to think what else I need to tell you guys. Thank you. All right. So, oh, thank you, Terry. So how do I harvest honey? Um, uh, excellent. Uh, thank you, sir. So, um, Beekeeping is a balance between making sure that you don't take too much from them. Um, I, I, it's more of an art than a science sometimes, to be fully honest. So um, to explain that, I might need to explain this a little. So this is a standard beehive. There are no bees in this, just FYI. Okay, it's a Langstroth style hive. Any honey that's produced in my bottom box, um, I actually leave them two boxes. Any honey produced there, I leave for the bees. I don't harvest that at all. Um, they, that's, uh, and I should explain. So honey is carbs for them. Nectar is sugar, okay? Um, pollen is their protein. Uh, they need a wide variety of plants. Um, th there's no one plant that provides honeybees everything that they need, okay? So that's why they go and forage all these different locations, two to five miles, um, kind of just depends what's in the area. So, um, once we reach, for me, my third box, any honey produced there, I'm like, okay, that's mine. This is excess honey. I'm going to harvest it. So that frame that Terry had um, is one of my lower boxes. Um, it has a combination of honey and pollen to it. I wouldn't harvest honey from my lower boxes. I would say, oh, you just keep that. What I do, um, sorry, it's about to get real messy. Uh, I use a grid between my boxes. Sorry if I drop stuff, excuse me. So this grid, basically, it's a queen excluder. I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, my queen bee's too fat, she can't fit through here. Okay, so it is going to separate out the honey that I leave for the bees and the honey I'm gonna harvest. Because if my queen can't get past this grid, my upper box, the shorter one, should be pure honey. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and on my frames, it should be all kept honey. I'm gonna wait until at least 80% of my frame is capped, which is an indication to me it's optimal moisture content, it's ready to go. If I harvest honey that is still uncapped, it might ferment, it might be too wet. Does that make sense? So, um, everybody does it a little differently. Um, I have a heat knife. Uh, I basically will rest my blade on the edges of my frame and I cut the cap off of both sides. Then I have a big machine that spins it, it's called an extractor, spins it around, the honey flings out into a bottling tank, right? So then you've got your honey and then you've got your wax, you can make stuff with it. All the above's okay, just depends on which one to do. It's very bizarre, um, things that you probably never knew existed. So um, here, some of the genetics of honeybees are aggressive, right? Um, we call them Africanized bees. They came from Africa, Brazil, up through Mexico. Anyway. Um, I don't allow my queen bees to mate naturally here. Um, I manage that process in all of my colonies. Um, she is instrumentally inseminated. It's, it's very similar to how they do artificial insemination of like livestock. Just very small scale under a microscope because I want to control the genetics. Because if I let her mate naturally, she has to go find drones in the area, right? Um, and the likelihood of them having those really aggressive genetics is extremely high here. Um, depends who you ask, 93 to 98% likely. So, um, I control that process uh, because I like my bees nice and calm. Versus other areas of the country, Missouri farm, we don't have them yet. Um, depends which bee labs, which experts you agree with. Some say um, the 40th parallel is kind of where they're going to stop. I hope that's true. Um, but, yeah, it, it's kind of a weird 
weird way of doing things. Um, there are some people in Arizona that say, you know what, that's just the, the genetic mix that you have. Just learn to deal with it. Um, I don't know if anybody's been around Africanized bees. <laughs> it's not fun, so um, I don't recommend it, no. but uh, uh, they're <laughs> extremely mean. But if it makes you feel better, you can outrun a bee. Okay. You gotta run in a straight line. If you zigzag, they will catch you. So straight line, if you can, into a building. Uh, flip the light on, they'll go to the light away from you. If you're out and about, if you can get in your car. Uh, but I will say, when you're running, you protect your face. Um, it doesn't matter if it's human or animal. Bees have developed, they, they understand that going for the face is most effective to move the threat back. So they will naturally go for your face. They like dark places, your, your nose, your, your ears, your mouth. So, yeah, but you can't outrun them. It's better to not ever have to deal with that. Uh, so for so. all the gardeners here, you don't have to worry about the... No, Julie's bees are very calm. Yeah, and, and if it, it helps at all, like this year, this summer was so hot, I didn't suit up at all um, for any of my hives around the valley. I was like, listen, ladies, it's just too hot. And they're like, I don't care, do your thing. So. Um, I haven't been in her hive, but typically uh, they do their thing. They don't really care. As long as you leave them alone, give them lots of food, they're happy. Um, if they're having a bad day, maybe just say, okay, today I'm just going to call it and I'll come back tomorrow. Yeah. Bees are happy when it's nice and warm and sunny. When it's cold or rainy, cloudy, they get a little crabby. So I should have explained because everybody always asks the smoker, right? You guys have probably seen the beekeeper with the smoker. Essentially, we light a fire in here. And then, this is like an old fireplace bellow, pushes air through here. We smoke the bees to calm them, in air quotes. Uh, actually, what we're doing is tricking them into thinking their house is on fire. So, we're redirecting their attention away from us down in their house. So, uh, it does a couple things. First, when we smoke them, um, it confuses pheromones. Makes it hard to launch a coordinated attack against you. So your guard bees that are like, oh, she's the threat, they're like, wait, are we going right or left? Um, makes it harder. Um, but it also, um, we will actually lift the lid, we'll smoke them all along the top of their frames. They get really loud and then they just disappear. Uh, it's a signal, hey everybody, house is on fire, go save the honey, that's the most precious thing in this house. They start eating the honey, uh, putting it in their storage tank, their honey stomach. Um, and they say, you know, that way in case the house burns to the ground, if we have it stored, we'll go build a new home, regurgitate it, put it there, we're not without food. Okay. Um, but I don't know about your bees here. Mine, you give it like 20 seconds and they're like, false alarm. Uh, or, uh, yeah, I have some bee classes. They're like, I'm not playing your game. Uh, so every beekeeper does it differently. I, I rarely smoke. I do when I'm teaching beekeeping so that people can see it, but my bees are calm enough. I don't have to. Um, but it's helpful if I need to add another box, it'll move them out of the way so I don't smash a bunch. And, and I'm in beehives virtually every day and I'm breathing that in as well. So usually, you know, if my bees are, it, like today, this morning, they were not happy that I opened their house and let all the, the heat out, I just threw a suit on. Just be like, sorry, I'll get in, get out real quick. don't have time, but I love making candles, um, lip balms, uh, furniture polish, um, all kinds of things, yeah. The ladies, do they ever get out and, or yeah. what, and what's um, their life like inside so this box? So basically, these were in a hive like this in my backyard this morning. Okay, um, okay. In a standard hive, we have 10 of these little frames. Uh, basically, everything's so sticky. The life of a beekeeper. <laughs> Um, down here in the valley, uh, so I should explain. This outer part is your frame, okay? It just holds your foundation. Um, typically, they're made of wood. Uh, they breathe uh, pretty well here. But the middle piece is the foundation. Um, in this area are heat. Um, I have to use plastic foundations. Um, it's wax coated, it's printed in a hexagon pattern. It's a starting point for the bees to create their honeycomb. So they will actually, we call it drawing out, they'll create honeycomb on both sides. Um, it'll be angled slightly upward, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but it makes sense when they're putting nectar in, it's not just draining out, right? Um, and other, like our Missouri farm, instead of the plastic ones, I prefer to use real wax foundations, um, let them draw it out that way. But it's real flimsy, so you have to embed wire crossways. 
Um, I'm a year-round beekeeper here. I don't have time to do that. And it doesn't work well in our heat. If this gets hot, all that wax could just melt off. So, um, but this is exactly what this is, except for it has honeycomb on it. So I just pulled one piece out to put it in here so you guys can see it today. And then once I leave, I'll go put them back in. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, linker. Hummingbird feeders. I, uh, I've never had out. the issue before, but this year the bees are just congregating and drinking it like crazy. So, yeah, good or bad? Um, well, so hummingbird feeders, it depends on the type of feeder that you have. Um, mine, um, I wish I had one that I could show you. I don't have anything. Yeah. Um, but it, it matters um, if they can access the sugar water. So the shallow ones, the, it, it's delicious food why wouldn't they go to it so I would venture to say because this summer was so harsh they probably had to venture further out to look for more food right so they probably found new sources once the bees find that source they're gonna keep going there because it's easy access it's nice sugary stuff um, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do about it honeybees um, anytime that they leave their house the very first thing that they do, they do an orientation flight. The first time they leave, they say, okay, I'm, I need to set GPS coordinates, a map to get home. So they fly out and they look for landmarks and they say, okay, here's my house. If I move that house over here, they may not find it. Um, if you only have one hive, it's more likely, but if you have a bunch of them and they all look the same, they will never find it, even a couple of feet away. So um, here, because it's so hot in summertime, we try to give them water sources um, especially in an urban setting to be like stay out of the neighbor's pool please um, so uh, kind of similar process um, our water buckets um, and, and you can use anything people use um, you know like plant potters with rocks in them uh, if you have a fountain they're gonna come to it uh, if bees fall in they'll drown so we try to put like a float or something that they can grab them uh, and pull themselves out uh, but you want to keep your water source in the same location uh, if you move it around Basically, it's hard for them to track to find same same process. Does that make sense? So I had someone call the office and wanted to donate an entire garbage bag full of wine corks. Mm -hmm. I didn't question how she got them. <laughs> but they're great little rafts. You throw them in the water and they just climb right on them. So if you yeah. see the water over there with a bunch of corks in it, oh, they're smart. little rafts. For them. Yeah. And oddly yeah. enough, honeybees actually, they tend to go to more stagnant water sources. Um, it, it's tricky because you're like, oh, I don't want mosquitoes. So um, it, I try to keep mine kind of changed out more frequently. But sometimes we'll establish a water source. We'll put like a cap full of bleach in there so that the bees can smell it and find it. And it kind of also helps keep nasty gross stuff out. But um, running water, the bees tend to not go to they'll go to the edges but they know uh, if i fall in i'm probably out so it's um that that stagnant kind of gross nasty smelling water they really enjoy like Ugh. so doesn't the bleach hurt them you, you would think so um <laughs> but as far as we can tell not really um in our heat the cert the, the the bleach will convert to salt anyway pretty quickly um now i, I mean even in like uh pools where they're like uh, doing the shock and you're like oh um, I've seen bees survive that, and you're like, I do wonder, <laughs> I mean, to a certain degree, you're like, it's got to impact you, but it's not, hey, it's going to kill everybody. I, that's not been my experience. So, um, honeybees are like the most studied creature ever, uh, but there's still a whole lot that we don't understand about them. Uh, we have a lot of theories and guesses, uh, but we, we can't always point to a study that says this is exactly what happens. Uh, we're working on all kinds of things, to be fully honest. So. Are in a hive? It depends. A um, well, so just one box like this, um, about 35,000. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a lot, uh, to be fully honest. But, okay. A few years back, I read somewhere or saw somewhere that bees were going extinct ish, that, that there was a shortage of bees. How, as community members, can we bump that number up a little bit? So, excellent question. Um, so, like I said, honeybees weren't native, right? They, they were brought in. Um, but what you can do is, if you can provide them food sources, water sources. Um, as far as people always ask me, especially gardening stuff, like, oh, what should I plant? Well, it's like, well, what do you like? Um, it, 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 do you want to do shrubs? Do you want to do vegetables, flowers? These are very different games. Um, but 
usually, um, in my experience, bees are going to go to the, the purples, the blues first. Um, they'll, they'll go wherever they can find food, but that's going to draw them in. Um, big open pollen, um, anything like that. The sunflowers, easy peasy here in the desert, blue pines, things like that. Um, lavender, they love. Good luck keeping your lavender all year long. Um, uh, you just replant. <laughs> that's, that's how you play that game here. Um, but yes, uh, if you can provide them a water source, um, if you see bees out and about, um, especially if you have kids, we tell them just look with your eyes, not with your hands, because sometimes that causes us issues where you're like, well, the beehive would have been fine, but now somebody's got to come in and move it and take care of it. So um, if you happen to have bees on your property and you're like, I don't really want this nest here, um, call a beekeeper instead of an exterminator. Um, I, I'm usually too busy to deal with it, unless unless you catch me on a good day. Um, but there is a bee club, central, I don't even know if it's called that anymore. I want to say it was like Central Phoenix Bee Club, maybe. I don't, I'm, I'm not involved in the bee clubs either. Um, I'm kind of too busy for that. But but if you look for like a swarm list, um, sometimes they'll come out and remove them. Um, they may charge, unless you can talk them into not. I heard that bees don't have very good vision. So if you're planting flowers for the bees, it's good to plant them in like big clumps of the same color. It's easier for them to find. Is that true? Um, I would disagree. I think they have really good vision. Um, but um, yeah, one one plant versus a whole bunch, abundant ones, because the bees are going to evaluate. Uh, I didn't explain waggle dancing. You guys heard of this? It totally sounds made up, but I assure you it's a real thing. So um, you remember our workers, one of their jobs is foraging. Um, they actually will do this little recruitment dance in the hive, in the dark. So that means they've gone out, they found this great food source, so a whole bunch of one particular plant they will go back um, and they do this little, it, it's done in a figure eight pattern. Um, you don't always notice that. You see the shaking. Um, some of my girls were doing it earlier, but basically this little dance that looks like a seizure um, is, hey, come follow me, I found this great resource. Um, researchers figured out based off the position of the sun, the angle, the number of times, it's given map coordinates, which is amazing. So, um, bees yeah. Don't, bees don't see in color. Um, well, bees, uh, like they don't they see the color red. It, it's yeah. it's different than our vision. Um, and there are other factors to it as well. Um, I'm sure smells, um, electricity of plants also um, to a certain degree. Draw. I, I know that sounds weird. Like some of the, some flowers have almost like a runway. Yeah, yeah. And it it totally depends on the development of plants. leads them to where the nectar and the mm -hmm. pollen is. Exactly. And um, I will say there was um, recently um, uh, one of the universities I'm, I'm doing some more study with, um, they were talking about um, a lot of the seeds, the plants these days um, have been modified and they're not as um, how to, attractive to bees. And they're like, so one of the things is they're like, you know, when you're thinking about planting things, kind of think more old school, like what's gonna be attractive to a bee? Because it, it, if you get something that's tasteless, colorless, they're not coming, and then you, you might get frustrated. Um, you're not going to get what you want. Uh, we're from uh, the northern Arizona area. Uh, what, what the, I guess, time of the season do beers, or the babies usually come uh, to the corn season? So, as soon as it, basically, bees are usually out foraging until it hits about 40, um, and then 40 or less. It, it's kind of, at that point, they're like, ooh, we need to basically be be gathering resources um, in, in winter time what they'll do they don't leave the house they gather in a cluster and they shiver to generate heat um, to stay warm in the winter um, so anything kind of uh, past that they're gearing up like hey it's coming um, does that answer the question yeah, so, when we get to the yeah. 40, be so winter time they're in once spring comes out they they may not be out and about every day but you're going to start seeing a little activity in the warmer parts of the day and yeah. then eventually they're all out and about we weather um resources really impact bees um so we do our best to you know kind of try to gauge what we think is going to happen but um sometimes it's mother nature wins your best laid plans don't work out you're like, oh. so you had a question yeah um you said bees weren't native here correct uh, before the europeans arrived but i'm confused what was one it was mainly wind pollinated plants mm -hmm. yeah so does that make sense yeah even though they're invasive we're like mm -hmm. 
I'd like to eat. I'd like to keep them around if possible. So, yeah. Thank you, Connie.